thick and larger and better overall experience um, anyway. So that part of it is nice to have the economic wind at your sails, I suppose, to form these isolated systems. But we are also seeing growth into, uh, yeah, centralised systems. I mean, it's, it's funny. I remember when I was at Rainbow and you get occasionally calls from people like, oh, yeah, I've got solar power. Um, but it turns off when the grid shuts down. Like, I was surprised that, that happened. Like, most people expected that they've got the solar on their roof, like the sun's still shining. Why don't they have power at their house when the grid goes down? So there was this, even then, aspiration, I suppose, to feel that independence from that external system, which, yeah, you just, uh, yeah, they don't care about you. <laughs> your, your, your needs and your very small on the scale of the things that are happening. So um, that drive to be independent, I think, is still there. I think it will increase as time goes on. I get, and, and becomes more and more available as costs come down. Be stay modular. Um, that is a bit of a funny thing. Again, the industry just continues to find itself it, uh, you know, as a good anarchist representation, um, that that uh, the way in which the technology is actually constructed in a modular solar panel, okay, of 415 watts, is the cheapest way for them to deploy that at mass. So what we've what we've found is that the same solar panels that are used on solar farms are actually available to us in a single unit. That's actually still we use roughly around I don't know 20 of these on a, on a residential household. And the same has actually happened uh, for mod modularization of batteries. So instead of us only being able to buy a megawatt battery as the production unit, what's actually happening is the batteries are coming out in small five kilowatt units, um, which are modular, but we can actually step up. And so this technology in its core, actually, you know, the lithium batteries actually start as basically the size of a triple A battery. Yeah, double A battery and a solar cell. And so this is, it, it's, um, it, it's just, it, and I don't know where it's come from, but it has become the way in which it's actually deployed in this modularization that allows us to tap in and grab the very smallest end of it and then offer in energy independence to people. And we can do it, it's not as cheap, but the cost reductions of doing it at scale are much, uh, aren't that great. Um, you know, by the, time, by the time we've got a team that gets out to site, so the biggest cost is actually transport to the site, but by the time they do a day's work at that site, it's a day's work, whether you're in Will Kenya or whether you're in, um, you know, Baringba deploying that solar, basically it's a reasonably cheap and cost-effective way to do it is one house at a time. Um, and the great thing about it is we haven't, where, where we win is that we haven't got any transmission costs there for. So our transmission costs from the, the roof to the power point rather than from Will Kenya to your power point. And that's where the saving of, um, of solar is really actually... Um, is, is coming is the fact that it's a diffuse energy source that falls very, very evenly across the Earth's surface. So whereby the hydros, there's maybe 10 good sites in the Nimbin Valley that we could deploy uh, hydro systems, and even wind-based systems on land are actually very limited for good sites. The amazing thing with, with solar is we've got this beautiful gentle wash of energy, but just, you know, these, uh, sorry, these photons of light that fall very evenly across the Earth's surface, so all of us can actually just generate power on our roofs. So the nature of the technology is actually leading us towards the degree of energy independence. Um, yeah, which is just this uh, an innate, you know. Um. Yeah, I sort of fell into something here, an idea I had. Rainbow Power Company used to produce microgrids, microgrid systems, where you can have whole of separate units all joined together into a bit like, like the big grid, but except on a micro scale. And I think that in a place like Nimbin, this is what we need to get into and, and get away from the central grid completely. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah. Amen. <laughs> and uh, look, that's, the government has started to make noises about that seriously now. Um, not as seriously as, of course, we want them to because, you know, that's government. But that's where, that's where funding's headed. That's where I think the future of power is headed because we're going to have a situation. I, I recall talking to the. Don't burn me out of here for this comment. I remember talking to the, the chairman of the Liberal Party's infrastructure committee <laughs> about eight years ago now, and he was lobbying the party to say, we we have a coming problem where only people that can't afford solar are going to be paying for our infrastructure, and this is you know this is a guy that's. If, I mean, property is his universe, but he, he's 
in that ideology and still able to see that future coming. Well, now we've got the 2043 goals and the 2030 goals and the, all the other air that we, we're not going to achieve, but they have, the, they have this impetus to actually electrify things from a multiple different standpoints now. I mean, we've, we've got situations where the majority of the CBD of Brisbane will be uninhabitable 50% of the time in seven years. Factual, non-opinionated thing. Well, what do they do with the grid infrastructure for those people? What do they do with the grid infrastructure for those apartment blocks? So one of the beautiful things that we were talking about this morning was that a community out here and MRI out here is that the horizontal version of the apartment block. Strive title is that, yeah. So we've got a great argument to build these systems here and then have that model taken to cities, taken to further out communities. But it, it's not it's not a far-fetched reality for us to be building sovereign power systems now because there's a government interest to it and it's going to save them in the short and long term. So it's a, it's a really, really exciting opportunity in, in history and we're sitting in it right now. So And regardless of how well we do with the rest of our climate change initiatives, um, we, we're going to see this mass need for power to be decentralised so that it's de risk from future you know, disasters, etc. as we've seen, I mean, floods, fires, everything else in between. We've, we've seen this already, so there is going to be a move towards this and we get to be a really exciting forefront for that if we're lucky. I guess, Pete, you, you mentioned the idea that you your vision was, or you have always advocated for standalone power systems. Yeah. yeah. And I, I guess what what I would say that the um, I guess as a um, as someone that sort of came after that and watched that, I, I moved to the area with with dreams of self sufficiency, dreams of being self sufficient, and that constant that concept of being self sufficient. My my uh, learning while I've been here for fifteen years. Um, you know, from, from watching the Aquarius experiment, the, you know, 30 years on, has, has actually been that actually the community is broader. So uh, I'm, I'm actually a believer that that self-sufficiency is, is about making myself strong, yeah, but I also need to rely on my, my direct community, but also my broader community, and that keeps on stepping out of rings of, of, of care. And that's the vision that I bring towards our energy systems, actually. So if I was going to say our energy systems, what, what I see now is that we will actually have a degree of autonomy in our, inside our own home. So we'll have solar panels and some batteries that supply our immediate house. If the power of shuts off, I have a small amount of power. I probably can't charge my EV at night time, you know, but I have a small amount of power that's available to me at that stage. But then um, then the wider grid, so what we're, what we're aiming to do at Jalambar there will be then a Jalambar based battery, so a large battery that's sitting at, at the network infrastructure, it's an interface to the network infrastructure that's then the interface then to 40 people on that community where they're sharing their solar resource, they're charging EVs up multiple different houses, it doesn't matter whose house is producing at any one time. So we're not just a little island there, we're actually sharing when that community resource is available. But then once the batteries are full and the EVs are all charged, I hate the idea that we turn solar panels off. So the idea of turning solar panels off, they don't last longer if we let turn them off. Um, we, we might as well use that power and transport, you know, the, that power then exit to the Nimbin community, the broader Nimbin Valley, and at our main interconnector, our high voltage interconnector coming into the valley, then we would have another battery and hopefully we would be able to isolate from the major grid. So if there's, you know, a fire, you know something happens to trans grid, you know, a cable coming up from Newcastle, that the Nimbin Valley could maybe still continue to have, you know, some power at that point. Again, we might be curtailed, we might be able to run our air conditioners, you know, at six o'clock at that stage. We would go into different modes of use depending on what infrastructure and energy was available at any one stage. And, and, and the technology is there for us to do that. So we've got the work to do. Rainbow Power and other engineers have actually got this work to do of how we're going to do that, how we're going to deploy that, at a, you know, at a, at a cost effective, in a cost effective way. Um, but that's sort of my vision of the future, I guess, going forward, is this idea of multiple rings of independence that actually fits really well, I think, with the ideas of Aquarius in, in some ways, and of independence and of, you know, community engagement. Um, yeah, and I hope that we're actually the ones that are investing the capital into that. So the idea that I can invest actually in my community battery and become an investor in that, rather than Origin investing in it. 
And I think we're going to have some huge challenges because now what's happening is those bigger players are realising the writing's on the wall and they will be proposing models to us that keep the control whereby we do have technology which allows individuals to invest in that um, and it's about us taking those choices or looking at, at uh, I guess, the implications of whether I lease my solar or I get the free solar off Origin. So that's the options that are going to be open for people is the idea that you sign up for a free solar system off Origin and you keep on paying your bill, okay? Or you can invest in the technology yourself and put it on your own roof. So there's still going to be models out there that are still centralised power models or central centralised capital models, I guess. Um, look, I think it was interesting you asked a question to um, to Peter about uh, you know his his uh, criteria and why he was doing this, and he, he answered about the potential of control by by government. Uh, we wouldn't be the only country that has been controlled by government by starving them out, by turning off the electricity, by turning off the information. Um, I think um, Australia has kind of grown up to, I think it's 34% of the, the power is generated by households or in that figure. So uh, initially it was electronic alt altruism, was it, because there was a subsidy. But <clears throat> what is going to drive it from here on if there is no subsidy? Are they going to continue to want to go solar because there's, there's not any attractive um, subsidy situation going on? Um, um, and I guess also... Um, um, oh, right. scaling, scaling up the system, you know, like mine... We've got a, 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 an Airbnb facility and initially it started with a, a, a 7 kilowatt generator and then we find after a year or so of it that you need more and more power because you naturally put on more and more facilities so you know scaling up there might be another issue that you could talk about and also the uh, the efficiency of solar panels and have they reached its zenith or is there is there more capability that's uh, that's inherent there good questions I'll ask all of them. Yeah. Yeah. so I guess the first thing I'd say was, you know, just something I can bring to the panel. As a global perspective, right? Paul and yeah, Peter was especially focused on his own backyard and his valley and his community. Um, Paul's sort of seen the growth of that to an Australia-wide business and into the region, and yeah, looking to sort of integrate that. You know, I'm, I'm moved out of Rainbow and into a global perspective. And one of the interesting things from getting that global perspective was I got to see, well, what's the effect of these subsidies and incentive programs? around the world, because they're always coming and going, right? At any one time, there's dozens of them that are starting and dozens of them that are ending in various different countries around the place. And what the net effect is, is basically zero. So any, on any regional country, you'll see growth ramp up, and you'll see all the pains of growth in that area where supply gets constrained, they can't find enough people, the scams sort of start up to exploit the system. All this sort of happens in that abundant moment, whether it becomes very easy or a lot cheaper to do it. And then at the same time, there's a market where the incentives are coming out or the regulations are increasing, which is another way they can sort of control the flow. Like you can incentivize installation by giving people money and giving people subsidies, or you can disincentivize by adding new restrictions and limitations and controls and rules that are required to install the equipment. So we've seen both of these phase in and out over time. But what's happening as a net over the world is that as the technology improves and becomes cheaper and more accessible and more reliable and more available to people, it uh, finds new markets as it grows. So you can incentivize and push growth and one country can go through the roof and grow 100% in a year, while another country pulls incentives, adds new rules, drops 50%, but the net result overall is zero between those two, right? One's doubled, one's halved. And, and the fact is the technology just finds new markets to deploy in as it becomes cheaper and as it becomes more reliable and as the alternatives become more expensive, which they are and are exonerably. Like we saw, um, well, the peak oil situation, right, drove an enormous amount of ideological action because people saw the writing on the wall that we are going to reduce, we want, it's a complicated topic to explain clearly, it's not my expertise, but basically the amount of energy you have to put in versus the amount of energy you get out is getting worse over time. We're past this age of easy oil where you can put in one unit of energy and get out eight, or get out 10. And so as that ratio decreases from the easiest oil, easiest energy in the world, which has been oil extraction, 
as that declines, you begin to find the edges of where that was previously profitable is no longer. And in cases like Paul's markets in PNG, that would mean that a barrel of diesel on the back of a boat going out to an island where you might be paying five or six dollars a kilowatt hour for that electricity at the end of that. Well, five or six dollars a kilowatt hour is a very viable market for a full off-grid standalone power system that's generated from the sun and can last a decade, even from a capital cost perspective. So in those extreme markets, that line just moves closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer until we're talking about, well, do we renew the Australia-wide power grid, right? If we have a massive, and we saw this in real time in WA and also in South Australia, we'd see massive costs from huge de environmental destruction. You know, side of this whole energy story is what's happening environmentally and the increase in storms and damage to the infrastructure we've got. And when it comes time to pop down a billion dollars to rebuild a, a transmission line, do we just say, no, we're not going to rebuild that line. Instead, we'll pop a battery on this end and a battery on that end, and we won't need the line anymore, that distribution anymore. And that's how, well, we're, we're seeing the growth from individual residential households up, up, up to a community scale, it's going to look at community scale, but that's also how it's going to emerge from the top down as well. So this technology isn't going away. It's like solar's going to get a lot more expensive. It's only going to get cheaper while all the alternatives are, are not here. I think we need to look at other things that are driving for success and then economic, particularly in a time like we're in right now, where I think lots of people are totally losing faith in governments and seeing, particularly, say, with the pandemic and now with the central bank digital currency, that they just impose solutions on you, you've got no choice. So I think that lots of people now are starting to feel that it's really imperative that they become independent of all that. And I think that should be the biggest driving force from here on. It's the, freedom, the, the choice of freedom where you can still afford to do it before you find yourself in a situation where you can't spend your money because you produce too much CO2 or something ridiculous. So, so I think we need to be aware of where we're heading. And I think lots of people are going to see the light and see that they need to become independent in every way that they possibly can. Uh, so another question is around the efficiency of the technologies that are around at the moment. So um, as I say, so I, I, I bought a, a solar power system off Rainbow Power about three weeks before I started working there. This is um, 15 years ago and my 135 watt panel was around about $1,700. Um, so what we're seeing is the efficiency and the scale continues to improve but the cost continues to be driven down through manufacturing. So in space limited uh, functionality like solar cars, like the solar challenge, your efficiency of your cell is, high, is, is the most critical thing. You'll pay a huge amount of money for a very, very efficient cell uh, because you've got a limited surface area. But at the moment it doesn't feel to me that we have limitations on surface areas in Australia especially. So what it, what it does come down is to your ability to be able to deploy that technology and that's a dollar per watt. Um, sort of factor there that sort of comes into play. So as, as, as solar panels, I, to tell you the truth, I don't know how they're making them for the cost of the glass. Like I, it, it's, uh, and with all technologies, basically you get an investment in the research and development phase, and then what happens is it gets closer and closer to the cost of materials. And solar panels now are at, at a base cost of materials. So just like the aluminium frame, you've got the, the sheet of glass is now 1.7 by one, nearly 1.2 metres wide. Um, the example of this was we needed to clean up the side of Rainbow Power Company and it was looking a bit grotty from a couple of car bashing uh, backed into the side wall of the shed um, and we were about to deploy EV chargers on there, we wanted to make it look good. I looked through a whole range of products that I could have reclad that, that wall with. The cheapest product that I could find that Rainbow Power can buy is solar panels. So we, we installed 15 kilowatts of solar panels facing east. Um, on, um, you know, facing east, which actually works really well for the company. So our company, Electric Vehicle, actually it does uh, around about a 250k round trip when it, when it drives around to customers each day, and it comes home empty after dark at five o'clock. So the issue we have is how do we fill that with solar power, okay? So what we need to do is we need as much solar as possible first thing in the morning. So this 15 kilowatt solar array, I would have never believed that I would have put panels vertically east of facing on, on a wall, okay? in Australia that just didn't make any sense to me when we did the maths 
Uh, it, it's producing probably only half as much as it would if we faced it in the right way, but it's still producing 50% of what it would, okay? But the thing is about the time that it produces is perfect for us. Because from 6 a.m. in the morning, this thing starts pumping out 15 kilowatts and starts filling out EV. You get about, you know, uh, 10 k's per, per kilowatt, so that's 150 k's range per hour. So by 9 a.m. in the morning, the vehicle's actually full, ready to actually drive away. So we're seeing, um, like, I, I agree that cost isn't the only motivator, but it's an enabling factor that comes into it. And when it adds up, we can deploy it. And that's, that's sort of where I, I see it sort of coming in. So this idea of facing panels south for summertime, you know, basically we're actually facing, like when I go to a customer now, I used to optimise production for maximum production each day. Now what we do is we try to spread, spread that production for the longest period over the year. We actually point panels to the east, to the north, to the west and to the south sometimes. Because what we're trying to do is actually make sure that we're trying to supply as much energy to that customer directly from the solar panel. Who would have thought that was the case? So, um, and, and that is a factor of cost reduction. Um, solar panels, I, I cannot believe they can keep on driving down the cost of. I just don't know how you, you, you make class for that price. What we are seeing though is, is battery technology. And so uh, battery technology is really the infancy of its, of its, of its cost structure. Um, the other sort of economic that I hear at the moment is I think it's um, uh, vehicle batteries are made for about you know, $100 a kilowatt hour. Um, we see them, we buy them for about $1,000 at the moment. So there's, for, for home battery storage, there's a 10 time uh, markup that's actually occurring on that as, as opposed to the raw sort of cell technology at the moment. The issue that we have as consumers here is that um, battery production is going to be stripped out for the next 10 years while we move our vehicle fleet over to um, over the batteries. So basically any new production of batteries, I can't see the cost coming down in batteries for quite some time because we're just going to mop up all of that new capacity. Um, that's just the scale that you know, the economics that goes on. Yeah, there's always things being said that remind me of something. And I was thinking back at the time when I was working at Bramber Power Company for something like 20 years, I think it was. I was commuting, commuting from home to Bramber Power Company home again on an electric bike. And uh, I, I charged up at home uh, and charged up at Bramble Power Company was there and cycled back home again. And uh, then I retired in 2010, 2011, I think it was. And very shortly after that, I had an incident. I was charging my electric bike at home, visiting a neighbour. And all of a sudden, I saw a huge column of smoke coming. Well, actually, I heard the, the fire brigade. So yeah. it's strange, the fire brigade coming up. And Bill Cox, I don't know if you still is, he was a fire captain at Blunov. He happened to be in a fire truck, just having paused at grass fire somewhere, driving back to his place, and saw this huge column of smoke coming from my place. So he saw it before I did, because I remember hearing the, the fire brigade siren going and wondering what the hell is going on here so I stood up and looked around and sure enough there's a big column of smoke coming from my place. So uh, quickly hopped in my car and drove up after the fire engine and my place was just a huge wall of fire, which is massive. Afterwards there's a, what do you call those people, the people that inspect fires and for, for what the sources and stuff. And I said well I suspect that it was the electric battery for the electric bike that I've left on charge that might have caught fire because I know that lithium is a very flammable material. I remember at school we used to be shown uh, magnesium burning. And if anybody's seen that, you get this really bright blue flame and magnesium of course is a metal and lithium is also a metal. Lithium is the largest of all the metals I think. But it, it's, it burns really brightly and it the thing is that if you build a battery with lithium, you have the potential of the battery catching fire. We've seen lots of examples of that in batteries catching in... Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I did a bit of my time there. And yeah, so that was what I thought, I'm sure that was the cause of the fire. So the, I told the fire inspector guy where I thought that the battery was at the time that the fire started. And he checked that and said, yes, sure enough, that's where the most charcoal was on the side of the pole that turned away. 
and that was sort of the start of the, sort of the fire shut with the lithium battery that was left on charge. The thing about lithium, as I said, it's very volatile, but the lithium battery will spontaneously combust if it exceeds a critical voltage. So it's very, very important for a lithium battery to have some kind of inbuilt protection that, that ensure that that never happens. Right, so in my case, I figured that that must have been a faulty controller that, that, that allowed it to go over voltage and, and allowed it to catch fire. So, yeah, that's, uh, I just wanted to fill in that little bit of history. Yeah. To reassure anyone with lithium batteries in the house right now, um, there's a few important elements in lithium batteries. I mean, Pete's right, like, at a fundamental level, lithium is dangerous and lithium batteries are too. Um, what we've seen is the move away from the very high energy density, high power density batteries like they have in electric vehicles. They still have them in some, especially ultra compact little scooters and things like that, where you want maximum amount of energy out of a very, very small space. And it's really incredible how much energy you can get <laughs> from a tiny little lithium battery when you push the technology to that limit. But the compromise, the sacrifice you make there is stability at those high voltages. And the energy density is just so high that, yeah, if something happens to that battery, could be overcharging, it could be physical damage, it could perforate the cell in an accident or something like that, it can lead to rapid catastrophic self-destruction. What we often see now in home-scale residential batteries where you don't need that energy and power density is the move to safer chemistries that self-extinguish. So uh, the most common one being uh, lithium ion, so LiFpO4 is the lithium ion, um, and that has basically dominated the residential lithium battery market. It has other advantages too. It's not just the um, power density and propensity to not explode, but it's also has very good cycle life characteristics. So where you want to station energy where the power density doesn't have to be very, very high, like it does for a mobile vehicle, and you want to cycle it for a very, very long period of time, many, many, many times, then it's actually better for superior chemistry in many ways. So yeah, there's a lot of nuance there. I guess that's why you have someone like Rainbow Power Company uh, to handle things like that, because they've done their research and products and chemistries and know what's safe. Um, I think it's just good to put it in perspective too. Dave Christmas, one of the founders, used to tell me a story. He grew up in England, and um, what, what it, the story that he'd tell me was that they used to have these big stone flywheels that were part of the printing press, and every now and again, these stone flywheels would actually come off the hinges and actually roll through, and they'd go through three city blocks before that stopped. So um, what we're doing here is we're actually storing a huge amount of energy, you know, potential energy in a very small space. Um, if that energy gets out, um, it, quickly, uh, there'll be a proportional you know, uh, response to that. So whatever technology we use here in, in the energy sector actually needs to be managed appropriately. And that's, that's where we've gone, I guess, from small scale, smaller amounts of energy with a certain regulation around it to being quite a heavily regulated industry because by the time we're storing massive amounts of energy in people's houses, um, we need appropriate sort of regulations that make that suitable. What about the safety systems for lithium batteries, or whether there's something that can be installed with the batteries that can sense the heat and, and then send an alarm or something like that? So I can talk to that. Um, guys, I'm percent right there, but it's really important we draw some lines actually between the different technologies. So there's multiple layers, and one of the things is the first thing that everyone says is lithium. So they use lithium. There's actually many different chemistries with very different reactions. And the description I'll give you is some lithium pouches, if you put a hole in them, if you perforate that pouch, it will release 100% of its energy. So if oxygen gets in there, it will have a chemical reaction with that oxygen, and it will release every bit of energy that's inside that pack. While uh, lithium, um, lithium iron phosphate, yep, ferrophosphate, yep, will, um, if you, you can puncture it, nothing will happen. Yeah, li lithium, lithium titanate, yeah, is another battery uh, chemistry that we can use. Yeah, so you can break it up, you can pulverise it with, with, your, with, um, yeah, with I don't know, a hammer and it would be fine. So the other one that I've seen is, is, is basically what happens if we short circuit that cell out. So if we grab the positive and negative and touch it together, that's a short circuit. And basically what you're doing there is you're releasing instantaneously all that energy. Um, and some uh, batteries, once we start the short, okay, if you pull it apart, then the battery settles back down. Okay, while well, other batteries, if you start that short, then you get a runaway chemical reaction and it's all over. So basically a, a fuse or a switch, which we've used you know, in, in electrical circuits for years to protect circuits, are fine because what they do is they detect high current and they disconnect. And so that chemistry is very, very appropriate and very, very safe to use in residential household systems. 
when um, when you can put a circuit protector inside there that would, that would make that safe. Where other chemistries, which are very high in density, so there's a bit of a chase, especially, and a lot of the stories we've heard have been through the mobile, um, you know, so laptop batteries on people's beds, you know, catching on fire. The other one was in the aeroplane industry. If you imagine, you could imagine the, you know, Boeing's uh, batteries that they had up in the cockpits there were probably trying to get very, very light and very, very high density energy. So they're an edge case of the technology. So there's very, very few um, uh, residential battery fires that are actually occurring because there's already a range of safe, uh, proportional safeguards that are in place. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah, I mean, I'm quite close to this. I'm, one of the unfortunate side effects of being a manufacturer is fires do happen. They just happen with electrics and electric and power and power electronics. And you see the response in this multiple level, a uh, multiple layer um, reaction. So you have at least the initial one should just be the system wants to turn itself off in a very graceful way, give an alarm to the user and say, hey, something's a bit out of whack, like this thing's too high or this thing's too low, I'm just going to shut down now very safely. And then there'll be a lower level where uh, uh, I've turned it off and I'm not going to tell you why, I'm not going to do it, I'm just going to cut myself out, disconnect. And then there'll be lower levels again at chemistry levels where it's like, oh, well, something terrible's happened, I'm on fire, but my power supply stopped, someone's going to hit a switch or cut off the supply and then fizzle out, basically. And then beyond that, well, what can we do to stop damage occurring in the real world? Well, we can put batteries in place where they aren't going to get repeatedly hit by doors or cars or little kids aren't going to go and play with wires and post buttons. Like, so and that's an install level. And then, you know, at some level, it's like, okay, we're just going to lock the thing up completely. We're going to put it in a special contained room so it does catch fire. It has a suppression system, whatever. So it's like in that, just that five or six different layers and levels of protection systems within that. And like, again, Pete's system, maybe he had one or two of those systems in place and they failed, unfortunately, for him and his house. But in modern systems we're seeing installed now, there'll be four, five, or even six levels of protection that have to fail sequentially and at the same time to reach a catastrophic outcome. There was just a, a battery about that size that was in a bike that caught fire that did all the damage. So, um, yeah, it wasn't the house battery. The house battery died because it was killed by the fire that resulted. Yeah. <laughs> Everything burnt up. Yeah, but the fuse wouldn't have helped. Uh, it yeah, but it was a fuse. It was like yeah, a fuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was a fuse. Yeah. But anyway, I was doing the Nimbin News. I've started the Nimbin News as it's mentioned earlier. So I was doing the Nimbin News in full colour version back in those days. And I read an article about it, and I, I thought that the title was very good, which was Lithium Carefully. <laughs> so anyway, that's, <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's actually a lot of media around around EV fires at the moment as well, and um, I, I think it's also that we put the risk into proportional, like I think what we need to do is be very proportional about the risk. There is risk involved, there's energy involved, but um, a, a, an internal combustion engine with a tank full of petrol can actually burn, you know, in a crash as well. So we are seeing a lot of images of an EV that's burnt after a crash. Um, but I, I think it's good for us to remember that dripping petrol, like 60 litres of petrol dropping on the ground at a, at a car crash is also very dangerous. So, um, yeah, I, I just, I think we've got to walk a very, very careful line here to make sure that we've got proportional response to risk. And 100% and that there should be regulation put in, in place and the industry should be watched, but um, that it needs to be proportional risk one of the things we are seeing is a like non-reactive, I suppose. It's a, it's a fine balance because nobody wants anyone to die. Right? It's a really disaster. It's a terrible situation. But there is also this sort of rush to over-regulate and coddle, coddle the, the market and the end user to prevent them from hurting themselves in ways that maybe they want to take that risk or something like that. So it's a constant push and pull from industry and, I guess, overprotective regulators to say, oh, we don't want zero, like, for air safety, right? It's like they have a real zero tolerance of any kind of accident, which means they're one of the safest ways to transport in the world. But it's also this huge rigmarole <laughs> to actually travel. You can't just get on an aeroplane, right? There's a whole process that goes through to manage that security risk to zero. And for some things, yeah, it just becomes uh, too much. So it's quite a, a balance between the two. And yeah, I think people like Peter Bettles will probably find that line one way or the other um, to push that edge regardless of the regulations or whatever that's in place because they know what it's like from a very basic level and we'll take those. So if I can take my Rambo power hat off and put my RFS hat on very briefly, the, um, the risk we see 
from EV is actually less than the risk we see from gas-powered cars because they're, they're an actual bomb. Um, EVs, we don't have a great strategy for putting out, but we can quarter them off. It's just a very good thing. Um, it's controlled. The, the other risk we see, if we talk about power generation, the houses we lose are from chimneys. Like, you're not gonna, we're not going to get the same amount of issues from batteries because it's a consistent technology um, versus lots of environmental error can happen in chimney, it's servicing every year, etc, etc. Um, so that it's the same as any new tech. It's, you know, they say pioneers come back full of arrows, well, the regulation arrows are the ones for fighting the moment, I think. Uh, it's, it's actually one of the larger challenges in the industry as well, is because we put a hand out for government money and government subsidy, uh, we then get scrutinised massively as well. So, as far as the industry goes, I'm actually really happy that those subsidies are winding up. So, one of the things that we're... So, our solar subsidies are, you know, uh, are coming to the end. There was, there was a question around cost as well, so we, and, and in regard to subsidy and subsidy that's there, I'm seeing subsidy being the smallest driver now inside this industry. I'm seeing everyone's power bills as being the biggest driver. Yeah. So what what's like? Um, I think I, I originally got close to eight grand, or probably eight thousand dollars for a, for a one kilowatt system. It was at one stage. Uh, for a five kilowatt system now, we get about twelve hundred dollars uh, discounted off the system. So it's a proportionally much smaller amount. Um, and really, what's uh, causing people to call Rainbow Power each day is actually they're getting a twenty five percent increase to their power bill. So. Um, you know, our average user now is going over a thousand dollars a quarter. So typically, an average user was more like around four hundred, five hundred dollars a quarter. Our average domestic user now is pushing to a, a, a over a thousand dollar bill, and that's without them actually having you know electric cooking and electric hot water necessarily. So, and that's going to come into our profile because you won't be able to use gas. So the drive is really going to be there. There's going to be a major motivation for people to try to reduce that cost, and it's going to actually come from the energy bill, not from uh, from direct government subsidy at all, which is great. Right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. What about um, the when you get subsidies? What are the strings attached? Is, it, is that a problem? Um, yeah. The, uh, the main string that gets attached, from my perspective as a manufacturer, is that you have to go through a very prescriptive process as a government regulator that says which equipment's allowed and which isn't. Which on its face makes sense, right? You don't want people to be able to put the subsidy for just a box of bots. Like, it needs to be able to do what it needs to say on the tin. What's been the net effect of that is you've actually concentrated power to say yes or no into one organisation, and they have no incentive to be more efficient, they have no incentive to actually grow the industry, they have, their only incentive is to maintain their monopoly over that control, over that distribution of that, um, that subsidy. So we see them just doing ridiculous stuff that makes no sense is totally inconsistent with global standards and the progression of the industry and everything, and just becoming obstinate because they are the ultimate person who allows or disallows that equipment to be installed, and then that perverts the market because of the incentive that exists. If you aren't on the list, and therefore you aren't playing by their centralised rules, which sometimes are just patently absurd, then they say, okay, fine, get on the list, and then you're at a much higher price in the market to the person who did get on the list. And sometimes those relationships internally have been borderline corrupt, who gets on the list, who gets an easy ride through, and who has to compete, and who has to really struggle and contort themselves in a global market with a single product to, to get onto that. So, yeah, the string is basically you're giving someone power in a, in a position where they are maybe using it to the best, altruistic, highest purpose. Just one other question um, about the conscience of the, uh, of the householder. When they're... Um, their system becomes obsolete or redundant or damaged. What about the recycling aspects of it? Um, how much of it can be recycled? Has anybody thought about it? Yeah, I wouldn't mind. I'll have a go to it. Yeah, so um, it's, it's a really interesting uh, challenge for the industry, and I think it's part of the industry's responsibility to solve it. Um, as much as it's the same responsibility for car manufacturers to, to have end of life plans for their vehicles as well. So um, again, I get a little bit frustrated sometimes that the ethics of the solar industry are uh, held to a higher, you know, a higher bar than buying a refrigerator. Um, so th there needs to be something put in place there, at least to get started energy products. So uh, is that coal-fired plant sold for a dollar to a 
you know, to a shell company and then, uh, you know, it becomes a government uh, problem to decommission that coal-fired power plant. So there needs to be lines in the sand for all energy industry and then rene renewables should stand up to that same, same level of bar. Um, but as, as far as the base technology we've gone, there has been some bad technologies that have been created, um, cadmium telluride panels. Uh, so having cadmium panels isn't a good idea when you crush them down and they leach into a landfill or something like that, you end up with a, with a waste product that's really bad. Um, the industry has moved away from that though, and what we actually have is our base, and Pete would be better to talk about this because he thinks of this level quite a lot, but um, you know, we've, we've got a silicon cell, you know, we've got some, some copper, and we've got some aluminium. Those, and, yeah, yeah, and the glass, which is actually silicon as well, okay? Um, and, and those base constitute, uh, uh, constituents of the solar panel are 100% recyclable. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that waste stream isn't lost, okay, so that we're not losing this highly valuable, valuable waste stream, and that we're crushing that and returning that into solar panels or anything else that could be made from those constituent parts. So, uh, but what I see as a core technology, there's nothing there that can't be recycled. So your, your base um, system can be a totally renewable system there for the production and reproduction of the solar panels that we need on the face of the earth. The silicon isn't damaged, so if we take uh, that silicon and remanufacture it, it's as good as it was 20 years ago. Does that make sense? So you can get a, a cyclic system actually in place for our energy production, and that's actually the same with our batteries. So there's a big conversation around the mining of lithium batteries at the moment. Uh, lithium's a dissolvable salt, okay? So it, it basically it's a salt that dissolves in rainwater. It ends up actually in our salt pan. So um, Bolivia are the highest, I think, concentrations on the face of the earth. There's the mountainous uh, salt, salt pans with high levels of, of lithium actually inside those uh, salt concentrates. And that's why it's being mined in Bolivia at the moment. But Australia is sitting on a huge amount. Think about that process. So we've got a dissolved salt that's ending up in, in salt basin. So Australia is really uniquely positioned to actually to supply lithium. Now, the, the greatest, I think, source of it is actually the seawater. It's the problem is it's just highly diluted. So where, where does the majority of our dissolved salt end up? It ends up in the, in the oceans. It's just a very, very diluted form. So at the moment, it's not economically recoverable from seawater yet. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I'll just, the, the other thing about the mining aspect of this as well, I just want to put in perspective, is, is, is when we're mining fossil fuels and burning them, we mine and we burn and we turn it into something totally different. It goes up into the atmosphere and we can't get it back. So the mining that occurs actually for lithium, the concept here is that if, if we actually mine enough lithium to create the energy storage that we need for our energy fleet, that's the only mining that we need to do once. As long as we don't throw that in a bin, as long as we have a 100% recycling program on that, we now have an energy, we have our energy storage uh, fleet that then could actually be recycled um, to create the, 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 I guess, the system that then continues in perpetuality as long as we use the same amount of power. Does that make sense? It's not a, it's not a constant burning thing. You're actually mining for a short period of time to get your energy fleet. So just. Yeah, a little bit from a manufacturer's perspective, but we don't make solar panels, so we do supply them part of the supply chain, and we sort of involved in the battery business. We're mainly in power electronics. And so that, and the renewable energy industry as a whole is actually a smaller subset than what's known as e-waste. And that's a much, much bigger global, but the same issues that Paul's referring to uh, problem. And it fundamentally is an energy problem, right? The only thing that takes to get these resources out, there's nothing special about it. You just need to put energy in to separate out. So it's, it's grinders and chippers and separators and sorters and leaches and filtration and all that sort of stuff. It's all just the energy that goes into that. And so ultimately it's like, well, how much as a society do we want to pay extra on our goods to receive them to get this part to be a closer loop system? And that's, I guess, somewhat comes back to Peter, like in a some ways, the home scale person, I mean, there are very small scale, very crude recycling operations that happen in people's backyards, but they're, they're typically awful. Like, and you, you find them in very poor countries where most of the e-waste will go. If it does get landfilled in Australia, it'll get packaged up in container ships and sent over to very poor countries with very bad environmental standards around working where they'll break them down by hand sometimes, or very crudely to separate out the fundamentally very valuable raw materials, gold, copper, lead, yeah, aluminium, you know, the, the fundamental building blocks that make these things up. 
And so it's just how much do we want to add to the cost of the product in Australia? How much do we want to make that part of the purchasing process? And I, mean, I think everyone on this panel would rather see that percentage higher <laughs> as a whole for all the products in society. But unfortunately, economically, the reality is that a lot of stuff just ends up in landfill, even though it really shouldn't be there and should be part of an increasing closed loop. Now, the, the thing that happens economically as well is at some point the cost to extract all of the restrictions around mining and primary resource extraction. Um, and it would honestly it probably would be today if, if mines were held to the standards that we sort of expect them to be, where they clean up after themselves and they don't destroy pristine, you know, delicate environments and that sort of stuff, which they still do, right? It's lost place in third worlds. Um, and even around Australia where mining happens and is a very destructive process at the primary consumption level. If that became more expensive, then we would immediately overnight begin to see more recovery effort of the resource that's already in that chain and what that looks like. There's no technical limitation, there's no impossibility, it's all just energy and money and then where that line is drawn and who decides. We're coming close to the end of our time, aren't we? Do we go get something from the audience? Anyone have any questions that um, Scott, have we got a, a microphone in the audience today? It'd be easier. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll give you a second. Yeah, good. It was, people are stretching or they're very excited. So <laughs> we'll uh, <laughs> got at least three. Try and take some questions. Thanks for your attention this uh, this morning. It's uh, I mean, obviously we're passionate about it. It's good to see uh, people also interested in hearing what's going on. Um, I don't exactly because I missed the very first part of filming. To give us a snapshot of how you see the future, you've already mentioned it, but we missed it on the film. Right. So if, if we could have it a second later. time, if you, you would. Oh, I think everybody would benefit from you just <laughs> giving us a. Well, I missed it because I was All right. I'll leave this for you. Yes. Yeah. All right. So. Yeah. Yeah. It would be exactly the same, but bad. Um. So, Rambo Power, as an entity, as any, any entity Testing, across one the two, world, one, two, three, um, I'm, <laughs> uh, only about 10% of business is done over more than a million dollars. Rambo Power is much more significant than that. We're in the top 2.4% of businesses on the planet. We're based in a small regional town and we, we create, you know, around 40 jobs. Just those two fundamentals for me are pretty exciting. And then you add another layer of that, which is the sustainability aspect and the future proofing of our region to that. And that screams ginormous opportunity for me. So the fact that we're in a company that has been built on an idea that was incredible at the time and was revolutionary at the time. I, I see, I mean, if I look back at the history, history of Rainbow and the photos, it, it actually looks like Silicon Valley to me. It, it's the same ideas, it's the same out there thinking. The first people that were in technology in these companies weren't people with you know, engineering degrees and weren't people in banking. They were arts people, because they were the only people that could think outside of the box enough to have these new incredible ideas. And so through time, deliberately and otherwise, Rainbow has fallen into these amazing generations of what solar has been, starting from panels from NASA to where we are now, where it's commoditized on a large scale. And the next step to that, we're so well set up for, because within our team, we have, we have an engineer that works for Boeing, that chooses to work for a little company in Nimbin. We've got Paul's incredible 15 years of like, hard-earned experience to engineer containers that can power towns. Like, the, the, the amount of talent in the business is phenomenal. The timing in the government is phenomenal. And the, the timing for our planet is, is right now. Like we're on the precipice where people have actually started to take action and we can do something with it. So for me, it's one of the most exciting opportunities I could see in Australia. And I, I've, I've looked at a lot of things and one of the criteria I look at if I go, I'm gonna seriously put some time into a business is can I impact 10 times to 1,000 times the amount of people that I could in another business? And within Rainbow, we can do that. We can impact millions of people in the next 10 years to be more sustainable, to be off-grid in a safer way for the future that is coming for us, and we can inspire our local community and empower our local community with jobs and with infrastructure that is going to fundamentally change the way that the future will be for the Northern Rivers. So 
for me, that's the that's the incredible opportunity, and the time is right now. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. Um, as uh, provider of the sound equipment, I get first uh, go with the microphone. <laughs> Each to introduce yourself because um, that will be handy. So maybe start with Zachary. All right. Yeah. So my name is Zachary Rook. I am the new CEO of Rainbow Power, and I'm sitting next to a whole variable group of legends in that space. Yeah, everybody knows me as Peter Pedals, it's because I was into stationary pedal power a lot, and I got mass media through that, but. Yeah, my real name is uh, born in Holland, it's a Dutch name, Peter von der Leek, it's the Dutch pronunciation, so that's where I come from. And, uh, and as I said, I was the one who came up with the idea of doing a power company, remember power company. And the idea was to get people independent, and I think we have now reached the same point as what we were at back then, is that independence now becoming absolutely vital for all of us. Thanks, Peter. My name is Guy Stewart. I'm the online community manager and online training manager at Victron Energy. Victron Energy is a manufacturer of renewable energy equipment around Australia. Uh, they supply Rainbow Power Company as well. Before I worked at Victron Energy, I was the chair of the board at Rainbow Power and also an off-grid system designer. Hi, my name is Paul O'Reilly. Um, I'm currently working for Rainbow Power, I guess as an overseas salesperson, so I sell systems into, into uh, the Pacific. Um, I have Thanks to Zach coming along and providing an opportunity for me to step down, actually, but I was the first general manager from Rainbow Power Company, um, and I've been in the company for nearly 15 years now. Yes, I'm Chris Arvin Guinness. Uh, I'm the spare wheel here, uh, modulating um, and trying to keep them on track, but they're quite professional, so they didn't really need me at all. <laughs> okay, Thanks. thank you very much. Uh, it's a joy to have you here, so I have to say I've never been pushed together. Um, this place comes into its own when, uh, when you set up uh, some forums like this with such fantastic information and such a very, very interested crowd. Um, it's nice to exercise all of the lighting and the power and the technology that we've got. We don't do it often enough. And uh, you know, within the community, I have to say that uh, the business is very well respected and loved and we're very proud of it. And we, um, we would love to see more engagement with the community um, to actually understand what is going on there, what you're doing, you know, we know you exist, we know you're wonderful, but to actually get some of the information we've had today uh, out in the community, not quite sure how we do it, but that's something perhaps you can put a little bit of thought to. Um, we can hold these sessions um, on a, uh, you know, spur or, or, you know, into the future um, to inform the community where you're at. Um, the other thing that I'd like to ask, or what I would like to ask, is um, what, um, possibility is there for turning Nimbin into the modern um, energy centre. Um, I think that that would be a real achievement from Rainbow Power and uh, there's certainly a great need for it. When you look at this building here for example, this is a, this is a strata type of building, uh, there's nine owners. Um, we've got a, we've got a um, one power system on the roof which was installed about 10 years ago. And that was installed by one of the, uh, the occupiers of uh, actually the candle factory. Um, there was not a full went into it because um, all of the other people who were in the building who actually do have a share of the building um, and also a share of the roof space um, weren't really thinking about power in the future. Um, we've got this magnificent big building um, that could be a, a, a test model for you know, um, systems that, that you've got and, and capabilities that are possible. And not saying that you have to do all that work yourself, but certainly consultancy with, with ourselves. And as far as the rest of the town goes, um, you know, the, the main shopping centre, uh, there's a new shopping centre coming in. Um, so I'd just really love to see more engagement with Rainbow Power from the community and uh, see how we can actually make this the model uh, town and village. We're talking about power and villages, so let's power this one. That's great, Dave. Uh, can I maybe just mention a, a bit of a concept or a bit of a challenge that goes forward? So the, the challenge we have going forward is how do we pay for these things? So we've got a, a trillion dollar transition in our energy infrastructure that's about to occur. Um, how are we actually going to pay for them, the, the, this transition to occur? Because often um, you've got dislocation between the capital, the money to invest in the technology, uh, the ownership of the, of the good roof space and the sunny roof space, 
and uh, the proximity to the power user. So where, you know, whether um, that roof space is actually the energy is being used right there underneath that roof. So there's these sort of, um, these three elements that need to come together. And when those three elements come together, it's a no-brainer to install solar on there. It does, they're out, that, that's our low-hanging fruit and that's where we go at the moment. So you'll see that Bolo's got hit, you know, and solar panels started going out on Bolo's because they've got big refrigeration loads. They're owned, so they, the Bolo owns itself typically. You haven't got a lease, lease, lease or anything like that. So they, um, and and uh, yeah, yeah, they've got access to capital as well. So um, one of the concepts or one of the challenges that I would love for Rainbow to work with the community with is a community renewable investment fund. So the idea of us decoupling that the idea of ownership and capital from the deployment and the areas whereby we deploy that renewable energy. So, um, so concept being there that we would actually uh, get some demonstration sites actually up and working here though, that we can get investments. So people have super, people invest in a whole range of things, but being able to invest in, in uh, energy production in our local area, so deployment of energy production facilities in our local area, um, and then finding that fund, actually finding then the, the economic ways in which the good places whereby that, that, those renewables can be uh, deployed. Um, we've got the, uh, the dairy on top of the hill here, they still have a very small solar system for their power usage. So as a community member, I could actually say, I want to invest in renewable energy deployment in my local area. The fund then actually finds the good rooftops, so i.e. sunny, which is a big issue around our area, and coupled to a local, um, you know, a local user. And I will just put that in there, that the, the low-hanging fruit is what we call behind the meter. So what we can do is we um, sort of, we, we don't need to interact with the, with, uh, with the legal system that sells, buys and sells electricity on the grid, as long as we work behind the meter. So that's in that the roof, uh, that we can, we're producing power on the roof and the consumer there directly uses it. So the example I'll give you is Lismore, Lismore Council had a huge amount of power consumption at their sewage treatment plant. They had a huge roof next door at the tip and even they have failed, even as a council, have failed to transmit that power back to one power pole and back in and be able to net the value of that power coming in. They'll, they'll get six, six cents for exporting it and 32 cents for buying it. So, so that's, that's the issue that we have sometimes. As soon as we hit the network, then, then it becomes hard for us to, to take action at the moment. And I'd say that that's uh, where the challenge with us is. As soon as we go out through that power meter, we're now into a heavily regulated government controlled industry and uh, we lose autonomy at that point. So we need to try to subvert that as much as we can. <laughs> we need to get as much of the capital, like um, if we have people that have good solar roofs and big consumption that they can't afford to pay with for it, and people are looking to make investments, green investments in the local area, I would love to see that happen, David. That would be great. Yeah, it's so frustrating. It's so frustrating. And this is 100% a human-made problem. It's entirely regulatory. The controls around interactive with, interactions with the grid and interactions with capital, right? If you want to try and raise money for a bunch of different people to do one thing in the community, oh my God, the legal and corporate and capital structures that come down upon you, if it's beyond anything detectable, it's just unbelievably restrictive. And it's, it's insanely frustrating as someone who has solutions to deploy two problems and everything in place except the regulatory system that allows us to do it without potentially losing our houses in in case something goes wrong. So it's, it's an incredibly, incredibly frustrating place to be. We've batted our heads against this many times, especially in cases like the Lismore City Council, where you just think it'd be so obvious. Right? It's like the same owner owns the same assets, one side or another title. They can control where the title's go, and they're the council, and you still just can't get it over the line to be able to bring the power across. It's very, very frustrating. Um, we, we saw one emergent opportunity potentially with the Nova when it started to get going, right? Because it had the scale potentially and the capital formation to be able to collect money from a lot of different people, pull it all together to deploy it, but unfortunately just due to the terrible timing of what happened and potentially foreseeable, but just terrible timing, the economic conditions of the Nova meant they had to fold because their core business couldn't sustain the cost increases that they incurred. So a very, very frustrating loss of, of opportunity there and the issue still remains. It, most frustrating it's not a technical solution, it's a, it's a human problem. I like that challenge. <laughs> um, 
the, the our timing with regulatory isn't going to increasingly be in our favour. Um, that's I don't want to speak too much to that at this point because I'm an eternal optimist. But there there is I, I see an opportunity as the grid issues become more and more pronounced that government will have to forcibly change some of those things. Um, in terms of your the initial piece of your question, um, community engagement is really high on my radar. Um, and communicating about what we're doing and why we're doing it and how the community can be involved is really significant on my radar. It's a, it's a big core piece of where I see our strategic plan going for the next five years. Um, and that's twofold. It's so that we can be an aspirational employer because the opportunity there for giving really high quality jobs with progression to smart young people in our community is really exciting to me. Um, and also because it means that we can create, I mean, we're a community owned organisation, we're a public private entity, but the reality is, you know, there's 164 odd shareholders that are all members of our community. So that's the people that we are fiduciary obliged to serve. So that's a real strong focus for me. Um, and looking at exactly the kind of thing that you're talking about with um, large groups and how we can, and can do ideas that are a little bit untouched at the moment, like community solar projects that play out to you know, multiple communities rather than just one single location. Question? So is, is Rainbow Power Company, is a private company? It's a, it's a public private business, so it's got 165 shareholders, um, but it, it's not listed on the stock exchange. Okay, unlisted public business. So you can buy shares? You can, when they become available, you can buy shares. Hello, I'm just here to talk about the elephant in the room, which is 240 volt AC. Sorry, you got that one? Um, nearly 50 years ago, I got a lecture from Chris, who lived in the day about the door thing, and he talked about the relative issues of the benefits of keeping to a limit of 24 volt AC or DC and the safety issues. And as a retired builder, I've had 40 years of paying $130 an hour to licensed electricians, when apparently it's legal to do your own wiring below 24 volts, or up to 24 volts. The real question to you is, when we look at suburban Australia at the moment, we get this sea of beige roofs or black or whatever. Is it in any sense at all possible that you can have a 12 volt something? Because nowadays, unlike 45 years ago, nowadays a lot of domestic retail stores are not 240 volt anymore. What's the unpack there? The reality is we do have a 12 24 volt market, it's mainly in automotive and marine, and there's lots and lots of appliances you can get. The five volt market in the USB accessories. Um, so there is that emerging uh, market, which, yeah, absolutely. The, the reason why you can nominally do your own, do it yourself, is that it's touch zone, right? It's not going to stop your heart if you get shocked with a, a low voltage um, AC or DC like that. So you're not going to get people kill themselves or uh, probably part of kill off people if they do a bad job and no one knows what's going on. Um, now, the other flip side of that is high power, and we do come to expect high power appliances. So as you decrease the voltage in the system, down from 240 volt to 24 or 12 volt, the current you need to supply the same amount of power goes up. And so you need very, very high current. Now, high current is not necessarily a bad thing, but it does become expensive and complicated once the current gets above about 100 amps. So at 100 amps and beyond, you deal with very, very fat wires, very, very thick switches, and very, very inefficient. Um, from a copper perspective, very expensive um, method of distributing. Very short distance is okay. From a battery to an inverter, for instance, where you're definitely dealing with that high current, you can manage it. But to wire your house in that to say, you know, run your electric oven at 12 volt, it just becomes a completely unfeasible, uh, yeah, situation from, from that current delivery perspective. Now, there's other um, reasons to, to do it or not in various cases. And, you know, if you are going to do your own wiring, well, it probably is worthwhile you stick to low voltage, unless you know what you're doing, because the risk of, you know, yeah, death of yourself or someone else goes up as the voltage increases. Um, we're, we're now seeing 
uh, home voltage systems go over 240 volts, we're seeing home batteries get up to 500, 600, 700, 800 volts, and the same with PV arrays uh, getting up to 1,000 volts DC. It's extremely dangerous um, for only very, very qualified, suitably attired, trained safety professionals because one absent minded slip up and you're dead, and it's a very, very dangerous situation. But the reason we're doing it is because you then get enormous amounts of power down very, very small wires. And the cost and efficiency of that process makes it worthwhile doing. Having an extremely highly qualified and trained electrician come in and install that system so that you can get what would otherwise cost thousands and thousands of dollars of copper down to a few hundred dollars, it's worth it to have that guy for a few hours come in and make that run. Um, so it, it's, it's not like it's a one or the other, it's not like it's a conspiracy to have everyone have to conform and buy electricians to do electrical work. It is available. We can, absolutely have a, a very good and full life on a 4 volt system and lots of people on the road in their caravans and campers do. Um, it, it's all available out there. It's just how what how powerful do you want your home appliances to be? How much energy do you want to consume? And when you start to get to the upper end of that, you, the obvious answer is to have really high voltages. Um, it's, it's an interesting one too that I think um, the perspective has maybe changed a little bit um, in the um, I've, I've, over the last 20 years, what we've done is, we, like, when I first started designing systems, I'd always take a shortcut, okay? And the shortcut I'd take is I'd say, how about, how about um, we put your hot water on gas and we cook with gas, okay? And that got you into about a $20,000 solar system for an off-grid system, okay? So, so to run our electronics, okay, to run our lighting, to run our TV, our fridges, it's all very, very possible, actually, at a, at a, at a very low power amount. Okay? Yeah, it has been for quite some time. What what I see, and I'm actually seeing it at John Bar. John Bar is an interesting situation. They're actually 240 there, but they all have what I call this skinny connection. They they basically save money on their power infrastructure by only putting 20 amp breakers as the main house breaker, um, rather than having a 60 or uh, 80 or 100 amp breaker, which most houses would have in Australia. So the idea there was that they could actually have smaller wires distributed around the community. Um, 20 years on, I guess John Bar 20 years, something like that. 20 years on. Um, I think they're actually going to, they're, they're a really interesting case because they've got a whole lot of really supportive people that the push at the moment is now to go 100% electric. So all of our household um, wants to install electric cooking, for instance, there, there goes their 20 amp breaker. So an electric cook, one appliance, okay, that's their 20 amp breaker. Yeah. So if they want hot water, okay, that's, that's another 20 amp breaker. So basically they're, they're, they're uh, and if they want car charging at home, if they want their electric vehicle at home, Okay, well there's, there's a 30, 32 to 40 amp breaker. So what's happening here is what I think our vision for the future was, was micro energy usage to supply the things that we, we could, but then solar got so cheap that we actually went, hang on here, we should be supplying all of our power usage, including what we normally put in gas or petrol or diesel, actually from electricity. And so we're having to rethink actually the amount of power we're going to be transacting in a residential house, which means the more power, the bigger the, 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 bigger the wires, the higher the voltage, that's how you solve it. And so that higher voltage has been came into play. And so we're, we're sort of having to use 240 in people's houses just for the amount of power they want. Um, and in fact, if you top off 24 volts, would be possible for instance. Thank you. Next question for the Thank you. Uh, we'll just say goodbye to Zach.
Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's one of the really nice things actually for rainbow power development. Is, again, I kind of find us stumbling into these sort of thoughts from, from 20 years ago or 30 years ago, but the economic reality for rainbow isn't actually going to be mass sale of solar systems. That's not where we're naturally fitting, okay, is into this, this mass sale of solar systems. What I believe our unique position to the market actually is, is energy independence of people. So from an off-grid background and understanding off-grid power, we have a unique proposition to actually offer communities. So um, I don't see us leasing solar systems. I believe that we will continue to sell solar systems on the, on the, on the possibility of them having energy independence. Um, as for the supply chains, I think the best thing that, that we can do is, um, is offer options for people. So we have an economic reality, which means that sometimes we, we have to offer a range of products in a, in a class, but we have an Australian battery, uh, battery manufacturer that we can use, we have an Australian inverter manufacturer that we can use, we do even have an Australian panel manufacturer that we can use, but let me, let me put the caveat there, no one is making nuclear battery cells inside Australia. So all of those products are actually being imported from overseas. I think what we can do is offer a market a range of, a range of uh, choices there. Um, it's really a question of quantity of scale for this stuff that comes into play, and I don't know that the quantity of scale is going to be there for Australian manufacturing. Do you think? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I've uh, just realised it's going to be somewhere. So, yeah, OK, so I just wanted to say goodbye. And, uh, Thanks, mate. Thank Yeah. What do you say about that? Well, all I can say, I mean, I, again, I'm frustrated because I am ideological and I, I do wish I knew that when I first went into renewables, it was, again, so frustrating to see Australia just squander what we brought to the market. We have some of the best renewable energy solar technicians in the world at the University of New South Wales. Really pioneers who have basically outlined from a theoretical to a lab um, tech level every solar development that's jumped generations for the last 25 to 40 years. And to see none of those have commercialised in Australia, none of them. And it seems so frustrating uh, to see that potential and that opportunity as an Australian, especially one who grew up in academia and always had parents who struggled with grants and the grant process and that whole system of commercialisation of Australian minds, Australian innovation, being immediately sucked out of Australia and then deployed to exponential growth scale overseas. To see that occur again in renewables is just an incredibly frustrating thing. But at some point, you just have to accept the reality that the way that we account for things in the world is dollars, and that's the rules we have to play with if we want to participate. So, at individual levels, when the option is there between two otherwise equal things, of course, you pick the one that's more environmentally sustainable, that's more ecologically responsive, that's more socially just. We can make those choices. We don't have to go out and make the world a worse place. But we do have to conform to this system that we're in as businesses that want to continue to operate to the multi multi dollar. Now, I think Peter Pedal's probably in a, some way got Rainbow started by subverting that model. If he wanted to make maximum dollars, it wasn't selling micro micro lights at a market. He he saw something where he was like, right, I'm gonna compromise my potential financially my, and sacrifice that to do something I want to do because I want to be here and do it differently. And those opportunities do present themselves once we have the base level of sustainability. So Rainbow, at least when I was there, would look for opportunities to do things that were interesting and potentially opportunistic in new markets where it wasn't the most economical choice, right? But you have to be careful and you have to balance it to make sure that those choices don't outweigh the ones that do keep you economically viable. Now, where, where I am at the moment is a different situation entirely because the business that I'm in is uh, manufacturing at scale and, and growth manufacturing at scale into billions of dollars where if you get the numbers wrong or the dial wrong, the whole thing just evaporates overnight because it's such a different um, operation. So, and it is a very, it, for me personally, it's been a very difficult one because there's some things which have been wrong, in my opinion, for many decades with the way the company operates. 
for instance, the recyclability of our packaging. Now, recyclable packaging has been a solved problem in industry for like decades in Australia. You can now get very good, high quality cardboard molded uh, recycled packages that can protect your goods for a very long time. But the cost effectiveness of those solutions can sometimes be decreased. So, if something, for instance, you get a container that floods and it's full of inverters and it's all full of cardboard packaging and the melts in the sea transport trip, takes two months or whatever it takes from the factory to the distribution centre, and you lose that container load of inverters, well, that cost of that is <laughs> very, very bad versus just filling with foam, which, you know, again, costs nothing, uh, is very, very cheap, but has this environmental cost of destruction where it's just burnt at the end, basically. So it's, a, it's been a frustrating process to try and push that change where I can see the opportunity to do so, and I think the best we can do as individuals inside these organisations that have an ideology is to see where those points are and say, let's push a little bit, let's take a little bit of cost and profit out of it and do the right thing for the long run and hopefully get there. But it can't be everything all at once the best way we can. We just go broke, unfortunately, and then we'd be no worse than we'd better off at all. That's, uh, that's the reality of actually trying to manifest change inside these big systems. Thank you. I'll just one more point on that. The, the, the best kilowatt that we can produce is the one that we don't use. And so, um, like a rainbow always starts actually trying to reduce people's flow profiles. So the first thing that we're doing when we're looking at anyone's power consumption is is how can we actually get you to the lifestyle, so a similar lifestyle, but without the waste and in the highest, most efficient way that we can get you there. And now let's design a solar system for that efficient use. So trying to actually reduce, like this, you know, we, we waste a huge amount of energy in the world and making sure that we, we make those questions about, uh, you know, what, what's the benefit I actually get out of my lifestyle? And there's some really low-hanging fruit. Like, lights are incredible. I, I sell, you know, lighting systems in PNG. They love the security of the night light. I try to get them to turn it off. They will not turn their light off at night because they just love the security of it. But that's actually high value to them. Okay, that's their personal safety, that's things like that. So I've got to just change my perspective on that sometimes. But, um, but you know, uh, as you set that up in your life, it's sort of like a law of depreciating returns. Um, an example of if you go to a resort in Fiji, and the spa uses as much as the 100 person resort. So a spa, you know, heating a spa in Fiji in the tropics actually uses more power, uh, more power than all the cooking, everything else, lights, showers, all that. So, so there's this disproportional amount of energy usage, and I think we've got to ask some really hard questions about what brings me quality of life, yeah. you know? And yeah, they're the questions that people ask. Uh, hello, everybody. <coughs> I should say that. Uh, I'm just a bloke, uh, so nobody knows me, so I want to say, uh, how are you today? Very good. Very good. <laughs> I'm leaving you a joke, but the, the joke is, um, it's very hard to get new ideas across to people. Um, if they contradict the narrative uh, and, and what everybody's been focusing on. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I, I, I've got a proposal that contradicts, with all you five gentlemen up there, contradicts the narrative of getting off the grid and getting independent. And I know Peter Pendles, I've met him uh, a few times, and he's very, uh, uh, very concerned about uh, getting independence because he doesn't trust corporations, and fair enough. I understand that. But uh, the proposal that I put to government is that everybody that produces less than 10 kilowatts of power should be able to sell that power to the grid immediately and it should be credited on their account immediately at 80% of the retail tariff that would otherwise be charged. So all power companies would be required to buy their power off their customers at 80% of the tariff up to, up to 10 kilowatts an hour, uh, 10 kilowatts, uh, so that's enough, you know, five, five to 10 hours or sort of thing. Um, and, um, and that's it. And you'll find, uh, if you get 50% of any population producing more than twice what they need for themselves, and that's always the case. You always produce more than twice as much power as you need with solar panels. Um, uh, there's enough power for the other half of the population. I mean, you know, we really want to think about this because this totally replaces coal uh, and gas fired power, potentially, because it's profitable for everybody to get their own power free and to have an additional income 
selling their excess power to the grid and getting paid immediately. And that doesn't only apply to solar, that applies to micro hydro and wind, uh, uh, wind of course, and, and wave and tidal and geothermal. At the moment, we're only allowed to sell solar into the grid and we get, what is it, two cents a kilowatt hour nowadays. Um, so it's just not worth it. So why would anybody go into trouble? The only incentive they've got is to uh, get their own power for free. So that's a proposal that I'm putting forward to the government, and of course I'm being ignored, left, right and centre. And it's because I contradict with what everybody's been focusing on. I come along and I go, who are you? Who said? Why would we do that? We're all focusing on centralised power, uh, renewable power um, uh, utilities, to solve, uh, to, to, to give the market enough renewable power. Why the hell when you can produce so much more power if you network micro inputs into the grid and, uh, you know, and, and include hydro? I mean, there's lots of people that have got opportunities for micro hydro, and of course that's been demonstrated around the end of the years. Uh, and and uh, geothermal, uh, you know, it can be micro geothermal, and you can, you can get work out of the couple of degrees of difference between uh, outside temperature and the temperature of the ground. So all of these people all over the country can all devise different ways of getting a constant flow of electricity into the grid and therefore a constant income, a residual income flow. That's my proposal. And um, please, if anybody can come along and tell me why they don't think it won't work, I'd love that because I get ignored a lot <laughs> and, I, and I'm hoping that people will you know, just think outside the box. Why do we want to ignore the distributive, the, distri the distribution potential of networking thousands and millions of micro inputs? Many small things make a bigger thing. We need to focus on that because otherwise we're going to have an hand basket. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of just points that I can add to that, I guess, is. Um, uh, we've, we've got an interesting phenomenon as well that, that actually government, uh, energy infrastructure used to be a government service, okay? And our engineers that are actually sitting in at, uh, at essential energy and stuff have actually come as uh, public servants to the energy industry, okay? And what used to happen was government used to go to essential energy and say, how do I keep the lights on? And they used to get a public, serv you know, a public servant giving their best opinion on how to keep the lights on. What's happened is since we've privatised the energy industry, the government's still going to essential energy and saying, how do I get the lights on? But now you've got a bit of a private entity that's actually bringing their opinion to that. So it's quite hard for government to move into this space of actually getting good advice and that's not, um, not commercially biased, I guess. So it's a very big challenge for government. Um, we're also coming from uh, those engineers that I often talk to as well just don't even believe this technology could be happening. So they've come from a centralised model whereby it came out, you had a big coal fire power plant and you had to get it out to the people. That was the challenge. And uh, and they're just not in a position to really, really see the potential, I guess, of, of what it looks like to have a totally distributed energy network. So it's quite a big challenge. But yeah, we're definitely beholden to regulation, that's for sure. Yeah, I definitely see the opportunity to emerge into new incentive models on the market, how to encourage. I mean, and yeah, finding the value balance is difficult between the people who want to centralise it and make the decisions for those assets and the people who want to decentralise, anyone else, <laughs> the, the grassroots. Where I, I do see opportunity as well, um, and we've still sort of seen it a little bit in the smart meter roller. Now, there are lots of problems with the smart meter roller for lots of different reasons, but one of the things that it potentially offered was the ability to incentivise and disincentivise demand at certain times of day, which is basically the counter to the point you're saying as well, which is like, Okay, we can incentivize production and feeding back into the grid at certain times of day. Well, how do we disincentivize when we don't have surplus in the grid at the other end of it? And I think those are going to be emerging models are going to happen once we start to hit this point where, okay, the answer to generation is solar, and then we have to conform the limitations of the solar flow to yeah, the reality of solar flow and the reality of grid um, consumption. And part of that is what Paul referred to, I guess, maybe earlier on in the talk, was we're going to see a, a huge electrification of our society, all these things that used to be gas, used to be oil, used to be petrol, are going to find more and more that they're electrical. And then what does that look like and how do we balance out the limitations of our society and our distribution system and our production across to make sure these all things are going to work out at the end of the day? Because if it all is allowed to free form, we have all these people, the individual who wants an electric car, 
doesn't communicate that load or isn't incentivized in some ways to charge that load when the solar supply is abundant, well then you're gonna have this massive load or this, in aggregate, really massive load at really odd times of day that don't match when the solar is really cheap because it's the feedback system to that individual isn't there. So I do see a lot of potential to really have a neat solution where we get a massive onboarding of very, very cheap solar into the grid, combining with a massive onboarding of very, very useful and greenhouse gas reducing displacement load, where all these like previously fossil fuel powered things become electrified, and then balancing that in a nice way that it becomes cheaper, becomes electrified, becomes much cleaner, less noisy, cleaner in the air. All of these values can kind of come together into quite a neat, cohesive little package, but it requires people who are actually actively fighting each other at the moment to sort of find that middle ground and, and to, yeah, work together, which is, again, the communication and coordination problem we've got in lots of areas of, of human life. So I, I'm sympathetic that you can't get your good ideas heard and platformed. I, I um, also share those. Paul has also shared those many times. We've seen very, very clear pathways forward to uh, improve what we think would be the situation for everyone and you just can't get traction in there because there's lots of stuff going on and how these decisions get made and everything else. Um, I think where we are now basically is our attempt to finding ways to have leverage and get our ideas implemented within the confines, in the constraints we find ourselves in. So, yeah, we're very, very, we try and avoid the government where we can, but sometimes the, you, know, you need to work with them or whatever and then, well, we're trying to have good relationships, but yeah, we, we don't have any golden keys or, you know, magic passes. We've, we've got our own ideas too. <laughs> We'd love to see deployed and rolled out a policy. But um, yeah, ho hopefully as time goes on and uh, the energy system begins to creak and grow and as it will more and more, um, some of these ideas will have their, their time to be to be implemented and we'll, and we'll be there to champion them, I hope. Rob? Any more questions? Well, I'd like to respond to that. I mean, you know, the government has been doing a lot um, why are people forbidden from tipping their excess power into the grid and getting paid for it? It's actually getting worse. So my, 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 my biggest fear at the moment is that we're just going to be outrightly regulated not to feed any power into the grid. That's where they're heading. Yeah, that, that's where we're heading. And, and it's, it's, it's basically a dumb response to what is a technical issue. So there is a technical issue about it. If we have a really sunny day, we have, we have succeeded so well in deploying so much solar that we can't get grid voltage is actually climbing, okay, to a point that's unsustainable, that you start burning out motors, you do damage to things because the grid voltage is climbing. Sorry, the system I'm proposing uh, addresses the interest of the issue. Yeah. You know, and because people are going to be selling their power to the grid when it's most valuable. Yeah, right? correct. Yeah. Yeah. And also, they're going to be all these 24 7 uh, uh, sources of renewable energy, uh, wave and tidal. Look, I, I, I'm, a bel I'm actually a believer that a market mechanism will be what actually solves it. It's, it's a highly dynamic system and, um, and well, like there's a concept actually that we have at the moment which is zero cost of, of energy. So we're actually getting to a point now that we're going to have a zero marginal cost of energy on a sunny day on, on the Australian grid. So actually power costs you zero. So if you're a major manufacturer and you could get a, a highly energy intensive industry that can run at um, deployable times, you can actually start to produce things like uh, hydrogen, uh, steel, um, actually at zero marginal cost for the energy input. That's a phenomenal area to be in. It's like it really, that challenges my economic head to work out what does that mean. But you need to be able to turn that product on and off. Now that's going to get more so because what, well like what I'm, my experience at a resident, residential level is that I'm actually deploying twice as much solar as what I would normally have deployed for that customer. They will actually never use um, 10 kilowatts worth of solar. They only want to use five kilowatts, but I'm just trying to cover off on the cloudy days for them. I'm just trying to make sure they're not having pie power. So there's all this time on a sunny day that we actually turn that power off. So for that customer, what we can do is we can actually, um, we, we bring what we call loads, so power consumption into those periods. So we can produce hot water, we turn the pool pump on, we turn the hot water on, we turn the EV charger on at intermittent times to, to mop up that energy. So, but that's a little micro example of exactly what's going to happen on the energy grid. So we're going to have huge amounts of production, well in excess of what's actually needed during the day. We can store it, is one option. Tone down, that will tone down. More, more hydro and, and wave and tidal geothermal. Yeah, yeah. We, we, 
it, it, it's it's going to be hard to pick. It's going to be really, really hard to pick. But I, I, like I believe solar will be the, the major generation source across Australia, and we're going to be looking to, to mop that up somehow. We're going to be looking to use that in different ways and opportunistically use it. And how do you get people to use it? You can make the price cheaper. So that's 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 the opportunity that's going to be there for people. So it could be great if you you might have a PowerPoint on your board that says if you want to charge a car for free, just plug into that PowerPoint B. Sounds pretty good to me. You know, if you want to want to charge a car, charge it one cent, one cent per kilowatt hour. You know, drive to Lismore for free. You know, for, for for ten cents. So they're the kind of opportunities that I think are actually there. What we have is a very very rigid regulatory framework, and that that definitely needs to change. So we need a much more hyper dynamic. And I don't, I don't know what that pricing structure is actually going to look like. I don't think one. I don't I don't think even that pricing structure will work. You know, if we if we if we made an optimum pricing structure this year. Okay, I don't think it would actually be a work in 10 years because there'll be new technologies that will be filling the gap and, and need power at different times and so on and so forth. You get 80% of the retail tariff for making money, so why? Yeah, the, well, the, the main argument for that, okay, is of the 32 cents that you actually buy, the energy component of that's only five or four to five cents. So, so, so transmission and so on and so forth. Actually, that, 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 that's the argument they make, though. That, yeah, that if you're going to use those poles and wires, um, something needs to pay for those poles and wires. And that's the argument. Oh, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I agree. And and I trust me, I would love to see something more than, than like we get six cents for export. That's about the price that we get for export. But, yeah. On the point that you just said, like drugs are more free, companies might start incentivizing people to come to them to get the free power when they're there. Like they, a town, for example, could say. Like that has a lot of sun, could say come to our place <laughs> and we'll we'll charge you for free while you stay here and eat our food. But there's whatever and then the, you can stay the night and then go home. There, there's an image that I use a lot, like I do a lot of tours for school groups and stuff, and there's an image I use a lot. Now the the, the challenge uh, from past engineers was how do we get uh, fossil fuels to our population base? Okay, so how do we build rail lines to transport coal and shipping networks? That my challenge, okay, my challenge of my generation was, and I used two images, and one is a picture of uh, solar radiation on the Earth's surface, okay, and the second image is actually photos of lights, okay, nighttime lights on the, on the face of the Earth. The engineering challenge that we have is getting that solar resource to Europe, so basically it's in sub-Saharan Africa, where the, where, the, where the light's falling in sub-Saharan Africa, into Europe, major energy consumer, it's from uh, the Mexican, you know, down in, in, in southern area of, of, um, of America, you know, into the northern northern areas of America. But you look at this map, and what just blows me out is Australia's opportunity. We're the high, highest solar radiation that sits on the, first, uh, on the face of the earth. We're more than sub-Saharan Africa. We're top tier, and we have Asia right above us. <laughs> so that that's the actual macro challenge. I know I know we're all facing a, a, a micro challenge at the moment. But realistically, we're embedded in this major, you know, major global infrastructure, and really, that's the challenge: is actually getting power from those areas to people that need it. Yeah. Sandra. Well, yeah, from all environmentalists like I, you're painting a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the solar panels are going to be like it. It'll all be it'll all be wet wi fi and. Uh... <laughs> no, no, look, I, I just I give a couple of examples. One is this, sick and the other is. A very uh, huge solar wind farms proposed in, in over in Western Australia. One of them, 15,000 hectares of flooded solar panels, uh, I think 8 or 9 gigawatts, and 12 or 13 gigawatts of wind power. Now, what is going to happen if we take just in one wind, in one farm, 12 or 13 gigawatts out of the prevailing winds, which provide Central Australia with the humidity from the Indian Ocean? We don't even ask the question. I, I feel we are going to damage the environment as much with the alternative energy as we uh, have done with the other things because the problem is not how we produce energy, it's how we use it. That's I, I agree with you, I understand that. The solar industry is going to be Functionalised like everything else to maintain a, a lifestyle which just can't maintain. It's, and it's, it's the same with solar, it's a bit more complicated to, to ask the questions. 
hiking into about 15% of the insulation uh, normally the Earth absorbs and the interest gets reflected back into the, into the atmosphere. Now, the last 250 years, we burnt millions of years of those 15% absorbed into trees and grass and stuff turned into, uh, into oil and gas. So we, we managed in 250 years to burn a million years of that stuff. Now, if we do the same thing now that we absorb that enormous, much, much more than 15% in a day or two to, to run this madness we are, we are doing in the moment, nobody can even ask the questions what we have said up there. <laughs> for, for the last millions of years that has co-evolved the, the, the Earth into a system we are living on, and now all of a sudden we're disturbing it so heavily. I mean, you know, I, I, I lived for the last 36 years uh, completing our grid and I'm um, uh, an enthusiast for our industry, but we do have to ask the question what we do. <laughs> I agree, Sandor, and, and I guess that's why I'd start with that idea about, you know, always looking at people's energy use, first of all, and reducing it. Uh, my, my question as well would be uh, centered around what, what's a fair amount of energy for everyone across the face of the earth as well, because we, are, we, we do come to this from a very privileged perspective. So if you're in Indonesia with 300 million people at the moment, um, you haven't actually got surface area to burn, burn trees and go back to wood fires or something like that. It's just not a possibility. So um, it, it's, it's a huge challenge, and I agree that just production is not the answer. Um, we have to get you know, all humans on the face of the earth down to a realistic energy sort of consumption. It, the, the, the figure that I've got in my head at the moment is the current global energy consumption. It's 50 square kilometres by 50 square kilometres of solar panels. It's uh, 50, yeah, 50, 50 kilometres by 50 kilometres. It's actually not unachievable. It's half an hour by half an hour driving in, you know, in the desert. So I, I don't, on a global perspective, I don't see that as being, you know, unachievable. And then I do agree that there's a question of, uh, of environmental impact. But if we can find that on roof spaces, we've already got that impact. So one thing uh, helps me. <laughs> I mean, I'm grappling with these problems too. And I, I like to start from base principles when I'm looking at something I'm doing. I've dedicated my life now to renewable energy, basically. So I like to think it's on a pretty solid foundation. Uh, one thing that helped me understand these global flows of energy, especially as it related to your original example, where we liquidated 150 plus million years of uh, stored solar energy and fossil fuels, is that that's a store. So we've taken what's been a flow of energy that's continually washing over the planet and will continue to wash over the planet for the indefinite future, at least in terms of our foreseeable lifetimes. And some of that's been stored and the infraction that gets stored is not very much, right? So yeah, optimal, conditions and most plants are not performing under optimal conditions. They'll take 10% of that solar energy and convert it into sugars at a 1% conversion rate, which they'll then convert into their wood stores at a 1% conversion rate, which will then get stored in the ground at some level or under some ecological system at a 1% conversion rate, which then converts into oil and gas under high pressure at a 1% conversion rate. You end up with what is an enormous amount of flow of energy gets stored into a tiny, tiny, tiny little fraction of end use energy that's available as a very, very, very fungible, high quality, high value, high liquid store. And then you burn it. And when you burn it, you get 10% of the energy that it contains, which you then send through power lines of which you get 20% of the power that gets sent in, which you then used to do something, but no one's even there, and it's just gone again. So you're taking this enormous flow of energy at great efficiency loss, storing it into something that's pristine and high power, and then wasting it at the other end. That process is amazing for when we had abundant available and when we were pretty crappy with our technology and we could then get an enormous amount of energy out of something that just seemed to be for free in the ground, not really thinking about the amount of energy that went into getting it there, and the amount of energy that was wasted when you pulled it out again. Go from that model, which is totally unsustainable, obviously, obviously unsustainable, a very, very limited window of time, and we've had like, what, 80 years maybe of that energy that's been out again converted, and it's, it's propelled the human race uh, technologically and everything else at great cost environmentally to where we are now, but we're energy kings, right? We're pharaohs of, of power, all on the back of this fossil fuel, um, like abundance, super abundance. 
Where we're going to with renewables is to take away that whole transformation. We're still transformity in energy, but we're no longer tapping into the store of it. We're tapping into the flow of it. So we're looking at what's coming down right now on the roof. And it comes down at about one kilowatt per square metre, about a thousand watt per square metre, of which we can get around 15 to 20 percent, maybe 25 percent if we're doing something really edge, into usable electrical energy right there. We've gone from what is like 10 steps of transformity, of which we're getting maybe 10 percent at best at each step, to like two steps of transformity where we're getting that. See, the conversion factor from the flow of energy to the realised functional utility of what you need today is so much higher in efficiency that to compare the amount of energy and the impact on the planet of having that energy combusted from a store to what's happening with renewable conversion of flow is not really a fair comparison for renewables. It's, a, it's quite a different situation. Now, I'm not saying your point is moot because renewables absolutely and obviously have an impact on the global environment, right? mainly, in my opinion, in the production and distribution and transport and installation. But a lot of that stuff is already, as Paul mentioned, in place, right? We, we actually have the roads, we have the factories, we have the manufacturing facilities, we have the roofs that it go, goes on. Renewables, unlike, for instance, say, a nuclear power plant or some other high energy um, endeavour, which is a massive new greenfields, basically, development, deployment of, of infrastructure, we're actually standing on a whole bunch of existing infrastructure to deploy renewables. Where you, and that's because for a long time renewables weren't that cost effective. So we've needed, to, <laughs> we've needed to have all the infrastructure in place. We've needed to have the roof there because to build a roof to put solar on it would be too expensive for the solar. We've needed to use the existing poles and wires because to build new poles and wires would be too expensive. We've needed to tap into existing opportunities of load because it, to find new ones would be too expensive. So. Each of those steps, because of the cost factor of renewables, because it has to be so efficient, because you have to, it was so expensive to begin with, has been actually standing on quite a big uh, advantage efficiency, efficiently, efficiency wise. So, yeah, that's a big long rave. Uh, I'm sure we could uh, talk more about it, Sandor. Uh, <laughs> you gave me some points which make a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Uh, and at least one person has asked the question. Thanks. I'm continuously asking the question because I don't want to make the world worse. <laughs> I don't think if we are deploying it on the statewide or international, that should be universities looking into your country and making, making sure that we are not unbalancing something. As we, it just needs research. Yeah, as, as we hit the exponential scales, my models break down, right? As things start to grow from large numbers to much, much larger numbers, then all the assumptions that I make in terms of environmental impact break down because it becomes a much more different thing. And we, we do begin to change it. We aren't just using existing supply lines, existing infrastructure. We're creating new ones for this. And then, well, what are the impacts then? It needs to be continually um, reassessed. Yeah, it's in your little thing that you gave a minute ago, like the, um, the storage, the, yeah. the, the flow, the, flow yeah. the thing that seems to not fit into that picture is the lithium. Because it, it pretty much is exactly what you described. It's like something that explodes all its energy. And, you know, you know, it's, 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 it's a form of storage, not a form of energy. Yes. Yeah, but yes, also yes. it sounded almost like the thing you were trying to describe. Like it's, it's concentrated down into a tiny little thing that explodes like da 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 Yeah. It, it, so it doesn't fit the model of what you... It's no. just one part of the picture that you drew that... I was like, but what about lithium that doesn't fit in that picture that you're totally, describing? Totally. It, it, yeah. It's a much bigger story. I already lost the yeah. word. <laughs> yeah. You've been very generous to stay this far when you've got five of us left. Well, I'm, me and Paul can now talk anyway. <laughs>